Hello, welcome to our new interview series, Transition Talks, Opinions on Low Carbon Transport and Future Mobility. With this series, we aim at capturing expert opinions and perspectives on how the future of transport and mobility might look like and on how to decarbonize transport until mid-century. Today, we have with us Jose Manuel Viegas. Welcome, Jose. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Jose, we are very, very happy to have you here as a guest with us to share with us your opinions on future mobility and low carbon transport. And I would like to use the chance to shortly introduce you to our audience. So Jose, you were born in Portugal and can look back to an impressive career in academia, the private sector and multinational organizations. You have been serving as the Secretary General of the International Transport Forum, ITF, at the OECD from 2012 to 2017. You also were the director of MIT Portugal's transport system focus area and founded TransportNet, a group of eight European university research groups in transport systems. You also serve as the chairman of the Environment and Sustainability Board of the Portuguese EDP group, are a member of the board of the Smart Freight Center and have been an advisor to the World Bank and the European Commission. You hold a PhD in civil engineering from the Technical University in Lisbon and undertook postgraduate studies in regional studies at the University of Karlsruhe in Germany. And Jose, I would like to start with the first question. Against the background of global climate change, joint forces and ambitious measures are needed to make transport more climate friendly. Given your expertise and experience as a transport professional and the former Secretary General of the International Transport Forum at the OECD, what are the three key challenges to decarbonize transport until the middle of the century? The biggest challenge is related to the long distance modes, particularly aviation, shipping and trucks on long routes. For these three modes, the current energy density of batteries is clearly not enough by different factors. For trucks, maybe three times better would be enough. For shipping, maybe five times better. But for aviation, we are talking about 30 times better. So it's, it's a big, big jump. So almost inevitably, at least on a transition, transitional state for the trucks, and maybe also for shipping, we need other solutions in aviation probably forever. So this may be coming from hydrogen, maybe from other solutions, but it is something that is, I would see, the biggest challenge. And it's a big scale, it's worldwide. The second one is more at urban level for the private cars, um, in which many people do not have a garage to recharge their batteries, and so this requires available infrastructure in great mass. From in many cities of the world, um, a large part of the car owners do not have their own recharging positions. So this is something that involves some big investment and also some, not only on the charging positions, but also possibly on the distribution network of the electric power. The third challenge is upstream from transport, but a critical one, which is to clearly increase and possibly quickly increase the percentage of renewable sources in the generation of electric power. So these are the three main ones. And how do you see the, uh, the further integration of the energy sector and the transport sector? What is the cru most crucial part here? I don't see it as a problem in the sense that the electrification of the transport sector is a very big opportunity for the electric for the electric utilities. This is a significant increase in their, let me call it, sales volume. The problems that are coming are not related to transport, but related to the nature of renewables, which is that the marginal production cost is essentially zero. And according to economic theory, the maximum efficiency would be selling at the marginal production cost would be zero. So how do you make a business selling at zero? So this is something that requires that, that represents a challenge for those companies and for the regulators of the power sector. So how do you make a case to ensure investment 
if the most efficient solution is selling at zero or very close to zero price. Mm -hmm. So this is, I don't see the problem with as integration with the mm -hmm. transport is essentially to build the business case for investment on a service that has this very low marginal production cost. Jose, let me come to the second question. Everyone is talking about often called case, connected, automated, electric, shared, mobility. What are the key drivers of the ongoing and future mobility revolution and will technology really make transport more climate friendly? I think it's worthwhile separating the, the case is for in two groups. One is the connected and electric and essentially we are very close to being there. The connected is something that we are already all connected via our mobile phones. It's only a question of bringing that into the car and that do there doesn't seem to be major consumer or regulatory barriers for that. So it's a question of um, the final bits of the penetration. Same thing for electric, we are not yet at the parity point in terms of purchase cost, but we are close to that. Mm -hmm. And my guess is that as soon as we come to parity in terms of purchase, we may have as the major limitation of the penetration of the electric cars, the supply capacity of the OEMs, mm -hmm. because they will be in trouble if, I mean, if you know that the car is cheaper than the combustion car. And if you know that the price per kilometer is one-fifth, everybody will want to buy one. And there will not be, already today in Europe, there is not enough supply. And so people are queuing to, to buy an electric car. The other two is a different story. The shared and the autonomous. I think the shared is the vital element in connection with the electric. The shared is the vital part to make the system more sustainable because of congestion. And so we have to have what I call the new paradigm of public transport at mm. intermediate scale, which means essentially instead of you fitting to the pre-established schedule and network of public transport, mm. public transport adapts to your mobility mm. requirements and brings the vehicles to you. But you, f you should be in the same vehicle with other people who are going more or less in the same direction at mm. the same time. So this demand responsible shared rights. This is something for which the algorithms today are not yet fully developed. They are very complicated algorithms, but we know how they should be done. So it's a question of investment in another probably two or three years. But then there could be the need for some either economic or regulatory incentives to push in this direction and also to overcome the resistance of incumbents, particularly public transport established companies mm -hmm. who like to operate fixed routes. And the authorities who contract those operations because they are simpler mm -hmm. to manage and to contract. And that, so that's the, the shared. The autonomous is something which each year seems to be almost there, but then ah, maybe not, it, maybe we need another five years to go. But when it comes, it is very important that we have the shared solutions already developed, mature, because the autonomous component is particularly relevant as a factor of cost re price reduction, cost and price reduction in the shared mobility schemes, much more than for the individuals. If you do it for the individual, there is a big risk that more vehicle kilometers will be made. Mm -hmm. If you do it for the shared modes, for this new public transport, this will be a significant element for making this new public transport really accessible to all. You don't need subsidies. It will be much, much cheaper. So this is the, combi the virtuous combination of these two mm -hmm. elements is something we have to bring into the picture. Together with that, for the small, for the shorter distances and for a much even bigger accessibility, we also should be counting on micro mobility. So shared bikes, shared scooters, which for trips up to four or five kilometers, if they are electrified, can be a significant element of a private, an individual, not private, but an individual form of mobility that congests a mm. lot less than going in a car. Mm. And so it's the combination of the mass transit, the scheduled regular public transport with trains and subways, then the demand responsive intermediate transport with shared vans, and then the micro mobility. It's this combination of elements 
that makes, I would say, coherent and very efficient, very attractive scheme of sustainable urban mobility. Let me ask uh, one point here. Um, you mentioned the potential increase of transport volumes by automated cars in the future. Um, if the cost curve would almost tend to zero once the driver, so to speak, of a, a hailed um, car is gone, and in addition, you can maybe watch an advertisement, so the ride would be almost for free in the mm -hmm. future, potentially. How, on the one hand, can we avoid that even the shortest trips are made by an autonomous uh, pod which you order, and uh, secondly, how to really ensure that public transport in the future can be still cost competitive then? It's, it's like this. Nobody knows. This is a, something that is still, too many elements are coming. But I would say the authorities have to be attentive to prevent developments going in that direction of, I would say, futile mobility just to come to a vehicle to do something that you should be walking or biking. Mm -hmm. I must say, even today, it already exists. When people have monthly cards or yearly cards or whatever for public transport, there is a significant number of people who mm -hmm. get aboard, take a ride of one, one bus stop, and then come out the next one. So this already exists. Lang trip lengths of less than 500 mm -hmm. meters mm -hmm. is already done. I don't know if it will be much more than that, because today, if you have a monthly card, the marginal cost of any trip is zero. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the pricing model, regulatory financial incentives. It's something that should not be too difficult to manage the size of the problem. Mm -hmm. But it requires attention from the authorities. And do you think that it can really contribute to low carbon transport as long as all the C, the A, the S and the E are integrated oh, with of each course. other? I mean, if, if everything is electric, if we have shared, it should be carbon free at the point of emission, at the point of transport. If the renewables are there in the background, it should be there. The risk is really that because the cost of mobility in urban areas would be coming lower, we have also to avoid congestion and mm -hmm. we have to make sure that we have equitable access across the urban areas. And this is also a very, very strong element in favor of demand responsive transport instead of scheduled transport. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, so last but not least, the question, how do you see the role of China in this global transformation of the transport sector? China is unquestionably the leader in what concerns electrification of urban mobility at least. And it has a absolutely dominant position in terms of number of vehicles, be it in two-wheelers and then buses and even in cars is the, car, the country with the largest penetration. So on there, it's clearly the leader and it has also been the leader and still is on the production of solar panels, which is an element, as I said, uh, very necessary to make the, the electric cars really sustainable. On the other fronts of the connected, of the um, shared, and of the automated, China is in all of them in strong positions, maybe not as clearly as in electrification, but the general forthcoming attitude of the public institutions and the willingness of the people to mm -hmm. adopt it are so strong. And the size of the market so favorable to gain scale quickly that this puts China in a very favorable position to continue to be, if not the only leader, one of the main leaders also in those fronts. And do you think that in particular when we're talking about decarbonizing transport until mid-century and the more sustainable development of the transport sector of the future, China will be also a leader in that sustainable um, development and in particular low carbon transport? I think all the elements we have presently point in that direction. There could be always in China, like in other countries, a change of national policies, but nothing at this moment lets us guess that this would be the case. On the contrary, it seems to be a continued um, statement of willingness to mm. go. And with all those conditions that I mentioned before, I would say it's a very favorable outcome. I mean, very likely outcome that mm. China would continue to be one of the main leaders. So, thank 
Thank you very much um, for sharing with you today uh, your opinions on the future of mobility and low carbon transport. And also thanks to the audience. Uh, we hope you will join us again at our next episode of Transition Talks, Opinions on Low Carbon Transport and Future Mobility. José, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.